Okay. Now let's talk about autoencoder. We may talk about it just for a short while. And take a break. Then, we will finish this part in the next lecture. The TA will announce homework. About autoencoder later. Okay, let's start. In fact, autoencoder can also be considered a part of self supervised learning. So, let's quickly review the framework of self supervised learning. How does self supervised learning work? First, we start with lots of unlabeled data. With these unlabeled data, we can train a model with tasks that do not require annotated data. For example, fill in the blank questions or the next token prediction. We have design tasks that do not require annotated labels to make the model learn from these data. Such learning manner is known as self-supervised learning or pre-training. After we train a model with these labeled data-free tasks, this model is still not that useful. BERT can only do fill in the blank questions, while GPT can only complete a sentence. For other downstream tasks, we have to fine-tune the self-supervised learning model. It can then be useful in downstream tasks. Among these self-supervised learning tasks, or among these labeled data-free tasks, or before BERT and GPT, actually, there is a widely adopted task that also does not require annotated data, called autoencoder. We can thus also consider autoencoder one of the ways in self-supervised learning, or a way for pre-training. Of course, not everyone will agree with this point of view. Someone might say that autoencoder should not be considered as a self-supervised learning method. This autoencoder has been there for a long time, which is proposed in 2006. However, self-supervised learning was proposed in 2019. Accordingly, whether the autoencoder is a self-supervised learning method is a matter of opinion. The problem is just noun definition. Actually, we do not need to care about this from the aspect that self-supervised learning does not need labeled data to train a model. I think autoencoder can be regarded as one of the methods of self-supervised learning. It resembles fill in the blank and predicting the next token but with a different idea. It's just a different idea. Okay, let's keep going. Here we take a look at how the autoencoder works. We utilize texts to simulate the input when talking about self-supervised learning. Now let's use images as an input for autoencoder. Suppose you have a very large number of pictures. The autoencoder is composed of two sub-networks, including an encoder and a decoder. What do these two networks do? When given an input picture, the encoder reads it in and returns a corresponding vector. The encoder may be comprised of CNN layers. It read a picture in and output a vector. Following, this vector will become the input of the decoder. Then the decoder will generate a picture. The network architecture of decoder may just like the generator of GAN. It takes a vector and output a picture. For both the encoder and decoder, anyway, there are multi-layer networks. So, what is the goal of the training now? The goal of training here is to make the input of the encoder and the output of the decoder as close as possible. Consider the picture as a vector. We want this vector and the output of the decoder, which is another vector here. The distance between these two vectors is as small as possible. Some people call this approach reconstruction. We first compressed an image into a vector. Then, the decoder needs to reconstruct the original image based on this vector. After that, we hope the original image and the reconstructed image to be as close as possible. Speaking of this, you may have a sense of deja vu. This is because I've already talked about this concept. When teaching cycle gen, right? For cycle gen, we will need two generators. The first generator transforms an image from domain X to domain Y, and the other generator reconstructs the image from domain Y. The more closer the original image is to the transformed image, the better. As for the encoder and the decoder here, the concept of autoencoder is exactly the same as that of cycle gen. Both approaches hope the reconstructed image to be as close to the original image as possible. Besides, the training procedure actually needs no annotated data. You only need to collect lots of images to train an autoencoder. Hence, it is a method of unsupervised learning. 
just like the pre-training step of self-supervised learning. No annotated data is needed at all. Furthermore, as for the output of the encoder here, we sometimes call it embedding. Remember? When we are talking about BERT, I also mentioned the term embedding. Some people call it representation. Some people call it code. The destination of the encoder is that encoding an input to a vector. No matter what people call this vector representation or code, it refers to the same thing. Okay, how do you use the autoencoder technology? How to use a pre-trained autoencoder in downstream tasks? I will show the common usage to you. This is a picture. You can think of it as a very long vector. However, the vector is too long for the downstream tasks. What can we do? You can input the picture into the pre-trained encoder. Then, the encoder will output another vector to you. It is more compact than the original vector. For example, the vector is only 10 or 100 dimensions. Then you can use the vector to train your downstream tasks. The picture is no longer a very high dimensional vector. It is compressed to a low dimensional vector by the encoder. You can use the low dimensional vector to train your downstream tasks. This is common usage to use autoencoder in downstream tasks. The input of the encoder is usually a very high dimensional vector. And the output of the encoder is usually a very low dimensional vector. For example, the input is a 100 by 100 picture. You can think of the 100 by 100 picture as a 10,000 dimensional vector. If we consider the RGB of the picture, it will become a 30,000 dimensional vector. The dimension of the encoder output is usually set very small. For example, only 10 or 100 dimensions. Compare to the original vector and the output of the decoder of the autoencoder. The output of the encoder of the autoencoder is narrow. In this case, the input and the output of the decoder are high dimensions. And the middle dimension of the autoencoder is narrow. We also call the middle section a bottleneck. What the encoder does is transforming high dimensional things into low dimensional things. Transforming high dimensional things into low dimensional things is also known as dimension reduction. About the dimension reduction technology, I believe, in applications of machine learning, you hear of it frequently. About dimension reduction technology, it actually involves very widely. So, we won't go into details here, because this course only focuses on deep learning related technologies. You can consider the encoder of autoencoder as dimension reduction. Then, there are many others not based on deep learning. There are many dimension reduction technologies not based on deep learning. I will leave the video link here. For example, PCA and TSNE. I will leave the video link here for your reference. Okay, what's so good about autoencoder? When we transform a high dimensional picture into a low dimensional vector, what kind of help does it bring? It reminds me of a scenario of the romance of the Condor Heroes. I don't know if you have ever seen the romance of the Condor Heroes. I will do a quick survey. Can people who have seen the romance of the Condor Heroes please raise their hands? Wow, there are so many. Good. Hands down, please. There are much more people than I thought. I thought everyone no longer watches Jin Yang's works. There is a scenario in the romance of the Condor Heroes, where Yang Guo goes into the Unfeeling Valley and encounters the disciple of Gong Sun Ji, who is the master of the Unfeeling Valley. That disciple is Fan Yi Wang. Fan Yi Wang is that person. What is Fan Yi Wang's weapon? His weapons are a steel rod and his beard. He can swish his beard as a soft whip. His beard is two feet long. It can be a very powerful weapon while whipping. Yang Guo fights against him for a long time, and it is hard to tell who is the winner. Suddenly, Yang Guo says, I will cut off your beard within three strokes. Everyone was surprised. They think although Yang Guo's skill in martial arts may be higher than Fan Yi Wang. It's not that high. How can he cut off his beard in three rounds? As it turns out, Yang Guo really cut his beard in three rounds. How? Because Yang Guo found out that the beard is controlled by the head. Although the beard is 20 feet long, the changes that the head can make are still limited. So even though the beard whip technique is seemingly very powerful, if you try to hit him on the head or slap him in the face, you will force him to dodge. 
which will force him to limit the way his beard can move. So he defeated Fan Yi Wang and cut off his beard. End of story. What does this have to do with Otto Encoder? Okay, let's think about it. What Otto Encoder has to do here is to compress and restore a picture. But why is it possible to restore the picture successfully? Think about it. Suppose the original picture is 3 by 3. 3 by 3 is very small. But let's assume it's 3 by 3. The original picture is 3 by 3. You have to use 9 values to describe a 3 by 3 picture. Suppose that the vector output by the encoder is two dimensional. How can we use a two dimensional vector to restore a 3 by 3 picture? To restore 9 values? How can we turn 9 numbers into 2 numbers? Then revert it back to 9 values again? We can do this because, for images, not all 3 by 3 matrices are pictures. Changes in pictures are actually limited. Sample a random noise, a random matrix. It's usually not the picture you will see normally. Or for example, suppose the picture is 3 by 3. It might seem that you would need 3 times 3 values to be able to describe a 3 by 3 picture. But maybe the changes in pixels are limited. Perhaps after collecting the images, you found out that the images were either this type or this type. Other types weren't something you'll see during training. In other words, since the variation of images is limited, we can utilize an encoder to represent an image using only two dimensions. Although the resolution of the image is 3 by 3, which needs 9 values to store in theory, there are actually only two variations of images. This way, when we see an image of this type, we represent it as 01. If we see an image of this type, we represent it as 10. So, back to our previous example. The beard represents the image in the complicated state which is the combination of all the pixels of the original image. The purpose of the encoder is to simplify things. Something that seems complicated could just be complicated on the surface, while in reality, its variation is quite limited. If we can figure out the limited variations of it, we can simplify the complicated things and find a simpler way to represent them. If we have a simpler way to represent a complicated image, we won't need as much training data during training. In the downstream tasks, we might not need as much training data to make the machine learn what we want it to learn. This is the concept of autoencoder. Autoencoders are nothing new. It has been around for quite some time. For example, in this paper published by Hinton, you know who Hinton is, right? Hinton is the father of deep learning. And in the paper published in Science back in 2006, the concept of an autoencoder was mentioned. It's just that the network they used back then was quite different from what we're using nowadays, of course. Let's take a look at how the autoencoder looked like 15 years ago. At that time, people didn't think that Deep's network is trainable. People thought that simultaneously stacking up layers and training them is impossible. Thus they believed that each layer should be trained separately. The technique Hinton used is called the restricted Boltzmann machine. Its abbreviation is RBM. I selected a picture from Hinton's 15-year-old article. You can have a taste of how people approached a deep learning problem. At that time, they thought that it's impossible to train a deep network. And each layer should be trained separately. But by the word deep, they actually meant three layers, which is not very deep nowadays. You already used more than three layers in homework too, right? But back to 15 years ago, this was considered very deep. Okay, so the three layers need to be trained separately. Here they called the separated training part, pre-training. But it's different from the pre-training in self-supervised learning. Do you understand what I mean? The pre-training of the autoencoder is actually a pre-training of another pre-training. The pre-training target is the autoencoder, and each layer's training is done separately. With RBM, train every layer first, and then connect all of them to do fine-tuning. The fine-tuning here is not the fine-tuning of BERT. They are fine-tuning the pre-trained model. Okay, but nowadays, seldom people use the restricted Boltzmann machine. It is actually not a deep learning technology. It's a bit complicated, and we won't go into the details of it. 
In this course. Why did no one use it now? Because it's useless. Ten years ago. All researchers believed there must be. A restricted Boltzmann machine in this deep network. Later in 2012. Hinton published a paper and concluded at the end that. There is no need to use. Restricted Boltzmann machine. So, no one used it anymore. For restricted Boltzmann machine. There was a magical belief that. The encoder and the decoder. Must be symmetric. The first layer of encoder. And the last layer of encoder. These two layers. Must be transposed to each other. But few people are using. Such restrictions now. In this slide, I just want to tell you. Auto encoder is not a new concept. It is a very historical concept. There is a common variant of autoencoder called denoising autoencoder. The denoising autoencoder works like this. We will input the original image to the encoder with some noise. You can create noise and add it. Then, pass the encoder, pass the decoder, and try to restore the original picture. What we are restoring now is not the input of the encoder. The input image of the encoder is noisy. What we want to restore is not the input of the encoder. What we want to restore is the result before adding noise. Results before adding noise. So, you will find that encoder and decoder not only have the task of restoring the original picture, they have one more task. What is the task? This task is the model must learn to remove the noise by itself. Encoder sees a picture with noise. But the goal of decoder is to restore the picture without noise. So for the encoder and the decoder, they must work together to get rid of the noise. Therefore, that you can train the denoising autoencoder. Speaking of the denoising autoencoder, did you find this concept not unfamiliar at all? The denoising autoencoder is not a new technology. In 2008, it already had related papers. But if you look at today's BERT, in fact, you can also think of it as a denoising autoencoder. On input, we add masking. Those masking are actually noises. BERT's model is the encoder. Its output is the embedding. When talking about BERT technology, we tell you that this output is called embedding. Next, there is a linear model. It is the decoder. What the decode does is to restore the original sentence. That is, for the place where the fill in the blank questions are covered. It restores it back. So we can say that. BERT is actually. A denoising autoencoder. Some students may ask. Why this decoder has to be linear. It doesn't have to be linear. It can be non-linear. Or let us put it in another way. This BERT has 12 layers. The smallest BERT has 12 layers. The larger ones have 24 or 48 layers. Okay. The smallest BERT is 12 layers. If we say that in the middle of the 12 layers, the output of layer 6 is embedding. Then you can actually say the remaining 6 layers are the decoder. You can say BERT. Assuming you are using BERT, you are not using the output of layer 12, but the output of layer 6. Then you can say, the first 6 layers of BERT are the encoder. The next 6 layers are the decoder. Anyway, this decoder doesn't have to be linear. 